Hello everyone, good afternoon. Welcome to um, the ACNC's webinar today about what to do before you apply to register a charity. My name's Matt Crichton and with me today is April Kitchenham. We are from the ACNC's education and guidance team and um, we'll be presenting today's session for you. And assisting us answering some questions or any questions you do send through via text will be Zane Worthington who works in our advice team and with Zane is Carolyn Doyle and she's a member of our legal team. So if you have any questions throughout the webinar please um, send them through and we'll do our best to answer them as they come in. Um, I may just apologise if you if you hear any um, odd noises or disturbances we're actually next to a construction site at the moment so I apologise if there's any drilling or, or banging that, that may come through on your speakers wherever you are. You can you can the joys of being next to a building under construction but I hope our room is sufficiently guarded from most of that noise and you won't hear any of it. So this session today aims to help you um, understand the things you need to consider before you apply to register as a charity and it will look at the information that you need to have of available when you do apply so as to um, allow you to get through the registration form with ease. We'll be having a look at um, issues such as legal structure for charities and having charitable purposes. There'll be information for people that haven't yet set up their charity and also for those that may already have an organisation, a not-for-profit organisation, but are considering whether or not they should apply to register their organisation as a charity. Depending on your own situation, of course, the information that you will need will be different, um, but we'll try to cover um, as much as we can and also cover um, as many questions as we can. Just on the questions too, of course, um, we'll try our best to get to all of them, but if, but if there are some questions that we don't get to or that maybe are a little bit complicated or, or require a, a more substantial answer, we may just... Um, respond to you later in a, in a more detailed email if, that, if that's more appropriate. And just a couple of things before we start. If you have any difficulties with the sound on your computer, you can try calling the phone number listed in the GoToWebinar control panel. Um, just on that, that's, that's not tech support, <laughs> that's just another way to, to um, uh, connect to, the, to webinar to uh, have some, uh, I guess, better sound for those that are struggling. With the questions on your um, in your navigation panel, on the in the go to webinar panel, which should be on the right hand side of your screen, just use the chat or question box to ask a question. After we finish speaking, we will hang around for ten or fifteen minutes as well to answer questions. If you wanted to wait till the end, if um, any of your questions are of use to, to everyone, if we think they're of use to everyone, we'll reply to all so everyone will be able to see the answer. But generally, as a default, we just um, respond to directly to the person that is asking the question. And we do suggest you keep your questions general rather than very specific or in a way that can identify your organisation. We do send a follow up email too. So if there are a few questions we haven't got to or if a few people are asking the same question, the follow-up email will contain some extra information that, that may be of use. And finally, we do value any suggestions that you have um, for us to improve the webinar program. So at the end, um, if you wanted to um, fill in the survey, that would be greatly appreciated. And if you have any um, suggestions, you can email them directly to us and our email address for this purpose is education at acnc.gov.au. Thanks, Matt. Hi, everyone. So here's a summary of what we'll look at today. First, a bit about us and what we do and don't do. Also, an overview of what a charity is compared with a not-for-profit. Then, a bit about whether or not to register. And, of course, what you need to do before you apply. We'll start with a quick overview of the ACNC, our role, and what we do and don't do. Uh, 
Okay, let's look first at what the ACNC does. The ACNC, the Australian Charities and Not-for-Profits Commission, is Australia's national independent regulator of charities. We register charities who can then say that they have met the requirements for registration and in doing so they have agreed to be accountable and to meet our governance standards. With registration, charities are also able to apply for some tax concessions and other benefits. The ACNC maintains an online database of every registered charity in Australia. We regulate charities by reviewing their compliance with their obligations to us, which includes meeting the governance standards. And we do look into concerns about charities raised by the public and even other government agencies. We also provide advice, guidance and education to charities about their obligations to the ACNC and, and just generally on good governance practice too. And finally, in, um, we have a responsibility in all of our work to try and reduce red tape for the charity sector. So we've just covered what the ACNC does but what doesn't the ACNC do? We do not resolve internal disputes within charities. The ACNC only deals with complaints and issues that relate to the legal requirements for charities under ACNC laws. Other organisations that may be able to assist with internal disputes include dispute resolution centres in your state, such as the, Dis the Dispute Cent Settlement Centre of Victoria. Next, the ACNC is in addition to, not a substitute for, your incorporating regulator. That may include a state consumer affairs agency if your charity is an incorporated association. Although we do have some arrangements in place to, accept, to accept some reports submitted to state or territory regulators. Also, we are not an advocacy body for the sector. The ACNC is a government body. It does not advocate for charities. Sector peak bodies such as ACOS, the State and Territory Councils of Social Services and your peak service bodies, for example, for education groups, do this on your behalf. And we are not trying to run your organisation or tell you how to run your organisation. We don't have the power to manage your organisation. We only require that you meet our requirements under the law. Beyond this, how you run your charity is up to you. The ACNC also does not provide legal advice. We can't give you information of what you need to do to register and remain registered as a charity. Sorry, we can give you information on what you need to do to register and remain registered as a charity, but we can't give you legal advice on how your organisations, on your organisation's particular circumstances. But we may be able to refer you on to those who can. Also keep in mind, the ACNC is separate to the ATO and other government agencies. The ACNC is necessarily independent of other government agencies and is tailored to the charity sector. It's the ATO, not the ACNC, that decides tax issues, like whether your organisation will be endorsed as a deductible gift recipient or DGR. However, the ATO accepts the ACNC's determination of which organisations are charities and what types of charities they are. We will touch on tax in a little bit, but this particular webinar isn't going to go into too much detail about tax concessions or deductible gift recipient. Um, we, we will cover that in a future webinar, but if you do have some questions about tax concessions, which I know is fairly popular, um, feel free to send them through and, and Zane and Carolyn may be able to help where they can, otherwise we may um, be able to respond to you in more detail in email later on. Okay, despite our name being the Australian Charities and Not-for-Profits Commission, at the moment we only regulate registered charities. As you can see in this slide, there, there are a large number of not-for-profits in Australia and only a proportion of those are registered charities. Within those, there, there's another small proportion that are called deductible gift recipients. So they're, they're the organisations that donors can, uh, once, once a donor donates some money to them, they're able to claim that donation back on their own personal income tax. So as you can see, not all um, charities or not-for-profits have that particular tax concession status. 
generally a not-for-profit is an organisation that does not operate for profit or personal gain or other benefits of particular people. It can make a profit, but the profit must be used to achieve its purpose. And importantly, not all not-for-profits are charities. As you can see in the slide, charities are just a subset of the broader not-for-profit category, and these are the ones that have charitable purposes for the public benefit. You'll need to show the ACNC that your organisation meets the legal definition of charity when you apply to register. The DGR aspect, as it's a tax concession, this is granted by the Australian Taxation Office. This is the concession, as I mentioned, that allows donors to deduct the amount of their donation from, from their own personal um, taxation income when they lodge their tax return. But again, it's, it's important to realise that not all not-for-profits definitely and not even all charities have this endorsement. Only a small proportion of charities and not-for-profits. Okay, apparently I've just been told that we did lose some audio connection there. I think we're back on now. Um, okay, it looks as though we're, we're, we're good to go now. So um, we'll continue on with that. I, um, I hope that the slide uh, does enough to tell the, tell the story there, but just a, a quick overview is that not all not-for-profits are charities. Charities are a subset of not-for-profits. They are the types of organisations that, in addition to being not-for-profit, have a charitable purpose that works for the public benefit. Um, and within the, the charities and not-for-profit sector, there, there is um, only a small proportion that are eligible to be registered as deductible gift recipients. Um, that particular tax concession with the ATO. So a lot of people mistakenly think that being a charity automatically qualifies them for deductible gift recipient status um, with the ATO. It's not actually the case. There are some um, particular criteria and categories of that tax concession which organisations will need to meet and that's determined by the ATO. We will touch on that a little bit later on but also we'll provide you a link directly to that information on the ATO's website that um, outlines the, the particular categories for deductible gift recipients. The important thing to take away from this slide though is that um, not all not-for-profits are charities and not all charities are not-for-profits. Are eligible to have deductible gift recipient status with the ATO. First, before you decide whether you want to apply to register a charity, and it's important to do some background research and ask yourself some questions before you start. So, if you're considering starting a new charity, you should ask whether setting up a new charity is the best way to achieve your goals, or whether there is actually another not for profit you could support or pool resources with. For example, Many people decide they want to raise funds for research into specific diseases after the illness of a loved one, or to raise funds for a disadvantaged or disaster affected community they have visited. Setting up a new charity is actually not the only option. In fact, there's a lot of work involved in this. In many cases, it may be more effective to contribute to a charity that actually exists, or to set up a trust which could be earmarked to go towards a specific existing charity or NFP. You can search the ACNC register for free to find charities that may already be doing the type of work you want to do. Just go to acnc.gov.au forward slash find a charity. Also, the Getting Started section of the ATO's not-for-profit area of ato.gov.au has some information you might want to review. If you have an existing not-for-profit, consider whether it might be eligible to register as a charity and whether this is worth doing. 
Many worthwhile organisations operate on a not-for-profit basis, such as your local sporting club or Lions Club, but they may either not be eligible to be registered or registration may not provide sufficient benefit for them. We'll talk more about ACNC eligibility later. Also, keep in mind, you may not need to be registered to receive tax concessions. Some not-for-profits not can self-assess and get tax concessions or benefits without being registered as a charity with the ACNC, but they can still achieve their goals. When you're thinking about these things, you can also use our checklist to help you decide. Just go to acnc.gov.au forward slash start charity. Thanks, April. If you do want to register your not-for-profit as a charity, you might want to ask what the benefits are and, and what you need to register. One of the main benefits is that your organisation will be eligible to apply to the ATO for charity tax concessions. These include um, income tax exemption or some GST concessions. Also, depending on your organisation's charitable purpose, it may also be able to apply for additional tax benefits, which come, um, the one I mentioned before, deductible gift recipient status, which come with particular um, subtypes of charity. And this is most commonly for organisations that can register as a public benevolent institution or a health promotion charity. And it may be, your organisation may be able to apply for endorsement um, at um, the state level also, depending on the particular state and the requirements with the, the um, taxes at that, in that particular jurisdiction. Also one of the important benefits is a presence on the ACNC charity register. This is the online free searchable database of all registered charities in Australia and it's where the public can find out about your organisation and see that it is regulated by the ACNC. So, each registered charity has ongoing obligations to the ACNC and must meet these to remain registered. First, charities must be not-for-profit and pursue their charitable purpose. Second, charities must notify the ACNC of certain changes and report annually to us. A registered charity must notify us of a change to its legal name, change to its address for service, that's where we send legal documents to, changes to its responsible persons, these are the directors, com committee members or trustees, and changes to its governing documents. These are its constitution, rules or trust deed. In addition to all this, charities, except for corporations registered with the Office of Registrar of Indigenous Corporations, must report to us by submitting an annual information statement. And for medium and large charities, a financial report every year. This statement is due within six months of the end of the charity's reporting period and is submitted online through the ACNC charity portal. Thirdly, Charities must keep financial and operational records. Fourthly, charities must meet the ACNC's governance standards. All charities, except a very specific group of basic religious charities, must comply with the ACNC's governance standards. These five standards set out a minimum standard of governance to help promote public trust and confidence in charities. And finally, as well as meeting the ACNC's requirements, you must continue to meet any other obligations your charity has under other laws or to other regulators. For example, if your charity is an incorporated association, it will still have to report to its incorporated association's regulator. Okay, we'll look at next at what you need to have sorted out before you apply. You will need to know the following um, about your organisation. Number one, is it eligible to be a charity? That is, in short, is it not for profit, firstly, and does it have a charitable purpose for the public benefit? You'll need to know your organisation's legal structure. Um, it can't be registered as a charity if it's an individual 
such as a sole trader, or a political party, or a government entity. Does the organisation have an ABN? Do you have a publishable name for your charity and details of its board or committee members, which the ACNC refers to as responsible persons? And also think about what tax, con tax concessions you want and think about which ones you will be eligible for. First of all, um, for your organisation to be registered as a charity, it must operate on a not-for-profit basis. And that's both while it's operating during the life of the organisation and then even when it winds up or, or closes down. This means that it, it can't operate for the profit, personal gain or other benefits of particular people, such as its members or the, the people who run it or their friends or relatives. An organisation can still be not-for-profit if it provides a benefit to a member while genuinely carrying out its purpose though. And a not-for-profit can pay a staff member and sometimes even a board or committee member for their work, but not an unreasonable amount. The payment must not exceed um, commercial terms and it should be consistent with the level of work being asked of the person. Importantly, and this is a tricky one where a lot of people um, d d uh, sort of fail to understand when thinking about not-for-profit, is that they can make a profit and have a surplus. It's just that these must be used or intended to be used for its charitable purpose. So a not-for-profit can keep its profits as long as the reason is in line with its purpose. For example, um, a charity may be saving up for a new project or it may be holding some funds um, as a reserve so it can continue to be sustainable for into the future. But it's important to know that not-for-profits should not hold on to significant funds or profits indefinitely, as this may suggest that it's not working solely towards its charitable purpose. Now you can demonstrate that your organisation is not-for-profit by including clauses in, your, um, in its governing documents most commonly referred to as its rules or its constitution. The two clauses that we've got for you on the slide there are examples of how you can do this. And um, it's important to know, so you're not frantically writing this down or trying to screenshot this, we um, do have this on our website available at acnc.gov.au forward slash not for profit. We will, can, we will include that link in the follow up email as well. Um, the not for profit clause sets out how the organisation's assets and income are used and how it's distributed while it's operating. And the dissolution clause sets out what happens to the organisation's assets if it dissolves or if it winds up. Also, some organisations can show that they're not for profit through the operation of certain laws. Um, and the most common examples would be such as the state or territory incorporated associations legislation or trust law for example for charitable tr trusts. After demonstrating that your organisation is not for profit, you also need to show that it has a charitable purpose. This is one of the most important elements. If your organisation is registered as a charity, the charitable purpose usually becomes what we refer to as a charity subtype. I'll explain this concept of a charitable purpose a little bit more. So a charitable purpose is the reason a charity has been set up and what its activities work towards achieving. Some people may refer to it as the charity's object or mission. Also charitable purpose has a special legal meaning developed over years by courts and parliament. The courts have recognised many different charitable purposes and as society changes, new charitable purposes are accepted. Since 1st of January 2014, the Charities Act 2013 has defined what a charity is for ACNC purposes. The Act lists 12 charitable purposes, which are listed here on the screen. As you can see, the 12 purposes cover a wide range of areas, from advancing religion, advancing education, 
to advancing the natural environment and protecting or promoting human rights. Some types of purposes that would be considered charitable include helping people who are experiencing some type of disadvantage, for example due to ill health, poverty or age, raising awareness of health issues, advancing culture such as preserving Australian Indigenous heritage through a museum or promoting the arts, or even protecting the safety of the public such as through a surf life-saving service. However, some organisations have purposes that may be beneficial to the community but are not charitable at law. For example, sport-related purposes are generally not charitable. However, they may become charitable if they have a specific charitable focus, for example, as part of a curriculum for a school or where, they, or where they assist people suffering from a particular disadvantage. Also, social or recreational purposes are not charitable. Some purposes that are specifically not uh, considered charitable include providing private benefits to people, such as members of an association, professional industry, engaging in promoting activities that are unlawful or contrary to public policy, and of course the purpose of promoting or opposing a political party or, or candidate. To be registered with the ACNC, your organisation must have only charitable purposes, or purposes which are just ancillary or incidental to a charitable purpose. Ancillary or incidental purposes are the minor purposes that further or support the charity's main charitable purposes. For example, an organisation that holds regular film nights for members may have an important social purposes, sorry, an important social purpose, but this would not be charitable. But if instead the film night was held to raise funds for the organisation's charitable purpose, then this may be seen as being incidental to a charitable purpose. Okay, so the other element is being for the public benefit. <clears throat> and what does this mean? Um, there are many ways that an organisation can benefit the public. It can provide goods, services, education, counselling or even spiritual guidance or improve the environment. There are some purposes that um, the law considers to be, that are presumed to be for the public benefit unless there is some evidence to suggest otherwise and these purposes include advancing education, relieving poverty and advancing religion. Charities may benefit the public generally or a particular group of people, for example a local community, refugees or, or young people. Charities do not have to benefit everyone in a community but any restrictions that they have must be consistent with the charitable purpose. It can't be arbitrary. So for example, a food bank could restrict its beneficiaries to people who cannot afford their own food but it wouldn't be able to restrict it to people based on their appearance. Or a healthcare support service may limit its activities to people within a particular geographic location. Your organisation may not be a charity if it's too restrictive with who can receive the benefits. For example, um, an organisation set up to provide scholarships to employees of a particular employer is unlikely to be a charity. Um, if you're starting a new charity, you'll be you have to choose its purpose. When you are choosing the purposes of your organisation, just and which ones might apply under the Charities Act, ask yourself a few of the following questions. Does the purpose really say what the organisation wants to achieve? Will it continue to be suitable over time? Will the activities of the organisation work towards this purpose? Is it clear and is it easy to understand for people? This, um, this uh, fourth one on the screen there is really important. Only choose charitable purposes that really match what your charity wants to achieve. Um, you can read more about the charitable purposes and in, in greater detail, I guess, at on our website at acnc.gov.au forward slash charitable purpose, that um, URL that you can see there on the screen. And again, all the links that we refer to um, 
in the webinar here will be included in the follow-up email so um, no need to be frantically jotting down all these web addresses they'll come delivered to you after the webinar as well as the 12 charitable purposes or subtypes in the Charities Act there are also two additional subtypes that your charity may be registered with if your charity qualifies for one of these subtypes it may be eligible for endorsement by the ATO as a DGR. So the first DGR subtype is called Public Benevolent Institution or PBI and the second is Health Promotion Charity or HPC. As we mentioned earlier only a small proportion of registered charities are DGRs as these are very specific requirements uh, sorry as there are very specific requirements for these DGR subtypes few charities will actually be eligible. First, you should carefully look at your charitable purposes and if you need help deciding which DGI category may be appropriate, then please contact the ATO or visit its website for more information. We'll provide a link in the follow-up email to the information on the ATO's website about DGI categories and their requirements. We mentioned earlier that you'll need to know what sort of legal structure your organisation um, takes. <clears throat> you need to know this before you apply to register. And if you're starting a charity from scratch, the legal structure you choose is actually one of the most important decisions you'll need to make. With the right legal structure, your organisation can do a, a, a few things. It will be able to carry out its activities effectively and in compliance with relevant laws. It will be able to evolve as it grows or changes and it will be in a better position to deal with legal issues if they pop up. Some types of charities um, may be set up using a particular legal structure. An example of this would be certain ancillary funds, but the ATO has particular requirements um, for this. If you're choosing or, re or reviewing the legal structure of your organisation, there are a number of factors to consider. This includes the size of your charity and the complexity of its activities. It's, uh, whether or not your charity will want to operate in more than one state or territory or even overseas. Whether your charity will take on employees or volunteers. Also the type of accountability your charity will have to its members, if it has any, and the public. An important consideration is also so the potential potential personal liability of members or office holders for things done by them on behalf of the charity. And also whether, or, whether your charity will be applying for government grants is, is a consideration and the value and nature of the assets held by your charity. And there are many types of legal structures. The, uh, some examples of the most common types for registered charities as you can see in your screen there uh, incorporated associations, company structures, and they would be companies limited by guarantee usually, indigenous corporations, um, private and public ancillary funds, trusts, and of course there are unincorporated associations as well, as well as cooperatives. But importantly, um, as I did mention earlier, it can't take the structure of, a, of an individual, for example, a sole trader ABN, that, that can't be registered as a charity, and it can't be a political party or a government entity. There is, um, there is some more information on the ACNC website, there, as you can see, um, at acnc.gov.au forward slash legal structure and also forward slash starter charity, and the ATO does have some really good information um, two. And again, I know I've said it a hundred times probably, but we will provide these links in a follow-up email for you. It's also important to keep in mind that the ACNC cannot give advice on which legal structure you should choose. We can, however, provide some information on the different options. So you may want to get legal advice on your situation as your organization's legal structure has very important consequences for how your charity operates now and into the future. As Matt mentioned, there's more information on our website available and also from the ATO and other not-for-profit not regulators as set out on the slide. 
It's essential that you have an ABN for your organisation before you register. This is one of the requirements. Um, if you don't have one already for your, or if you're thinking of starting up an organisation, you can apply for one at the um, Australian Business Register website online, and that's at abr.gov.au. It can take some time to get your ABN. When you apply for your ABN, you need to know a few things. Number one, make sure the name under which you're applying for an ABN is exactly the same as the one you've chosen as the charity's legal name and the one that's um, on the charity's governing documents. Also, check that the ABN entity type is the right one for the legal structure that you've created. If it isn't, you may need to reapply for a new ABN and this could really delay your charity application. That, for example, that would be if you if you decide to set up an incorporated association for your charity, and then when you apply for your ABN and you apply as a as a private company or as a as a company structure or or something different, um, it it will need to be it will need to be fixed and made um, the same as the structure that you've chosen. So make sure you choose the entity type correctly, um, and also apply for your ABN as soon as possible. We we can't register charities before they have an ABN, and the effective date of registration cannot predate the beginning of the ABN as well. So get onto that as soon as possible. If you do have any inquiries about the ABN specifically, um, we suggest you contact the Australian Business Register um, and you can get their details from their website. So the next step is once you've decided on your charity's legal structure, you'll need to create or have access to your governing documents. So as we mentioned, these are for example your rules or your constitution, articles of association or trust deed. The governing document is a very important part of the registration application and you'll be asked to provide a copy. It must set out as a bare minimum the purpose of the charity and that the charity will operate on a not-for-profit basis, both during its lifetime and also and if and also if when the charity is wound up. It also generally sets out certain things like its membership rules, how it will make decisions, how meetings are held, and how people are appointed to the organization's governing body, such as the committee members um, or management of board and the powers they have. If you believe your organisation may be eligible for DGR endorsement, you'll also need to have certain clauses in your governing document. You can find more at acnc.gov.au forward slash not for profit and also um, there's an example on the ATO's website and again we'll provide the link um, in the follow-up email so there's no need to worry about yeah, writing that down now. On the ACNC website there, we do have a page dedicated to some information about governing documents and the um, different types of, uh, of four different types of legal structures. So if you're starting a new charity, <clears throat> or even if you want to upgrade your your existing organisation's governing document, you can use um, one of the templates. The, the template you select will depend upon the type of structure your organisation um, is or, or will be. For example, people, um, as I mentioned before, if you want to register a um, company limited by guarantee, then we have a template constitution um, available for that purpose. Also, if you're setting up an incorporated association, all of the state regulators of incorporated associations have a standard set of rules, often referred to as the model rules. And you, they're um, easily accessible from the relevant state regulators website. And ORIC um, for Indigenous corporations has a set of um, rules as well. When using the template, just make sure you've got the right one for the right legal structure for your charity and you would adapt it to suit your charity's needs. So you'll, you'll need to put in your charity's objects and purposes and, and um, the name of your charity and that sort of thing. And make sure you meet the requirements of both the ACNC and any other relevant regulator. If you do want to go ahead and try and create your own from scratch, it must contain all the necessary clauses for us to register your organisation as a charity. Um, 
it may be a, a big job, but, but some people have done it, and it may be something that you want to consider. Um, if you're unsure about how to um, do this, start from scratch, and all the advice, uh, sorry, all the um, clauses that you need to con um, have in there, you may want to consider getting some professional advice. But there is some help on our website there to get you started. The um, URL is acnc.gov.au forward slash governing document, as you can see at the bottom of the screen. Another thing you need to consider is, of course, your charity's name and using it as part of your registration. If you already have an NFP set up, its legal name is generally the same name that you have registered with any other regulator, such as ASIC, Fair Trading, Consumer Affairs or ORIC. It should be the name that is on front of your governing documents. If you're starting a new organisation, you can choose your organisation's name. There are some important things to know when doing it though. Keep in mind that some regulators require the name to include the type of legal structure. For example, you'll often see company names ending in the word limited or incorporated associations ending in incorporated. Many regulators, including the ACNC, are unlikely to accept or publish the names of organisations with the same name or a very similar name to that of another already existing organisation. This is because of the potential confusion that it can cause. So when choosing a new name, you should consider choosing something distinctive so that someone can find your charity when searching the register. So, you know, I wouldn't call it the Museum Trust, for example, as that might return hundreds of charities with these common words in their name. Um, I'd avoid using words or acronyms that could cause offence in English or another language and check that, you're, um, that you have permission to use the name, for example, if it's somebody's name or if it's subject to intellectual property rights, such as a trademark. And avoid misleading names, for example, suggesting the charity does something or works in a particular location when in fact doesn't. It might be handy to use the ACNC register to search for names of existing charities and also the Australian Business Register. You should be able to see that URL um, to those websites on your screen now. And to register a charity, you also need to tell us the details of what we refer to as the responsible persons of your organisation. These are the people responsible for the governance and the direction of, of the charity. The charity, uh, the ACNC charity application asks for the details of all of your organisation's responsible persons, not just one. You must include their names, dates of birth and addresses in the charity application. Because the responsible persons are the people that have the ultimate responsibility for controlling the direction and the governance of, your, of the charity, it's important to choose appropriate people for these roles. It's also important that the people um, understand their roles and, and what they involve. The responsibilities of the responsible persons include um, directing the affairs of the charity, ensuring that it's able to meet its liabilities and it's well run, and ensuring that it pursues the charitable purposes that it was set up for. The charity has obligations under the ACNC governance standards to make sure these people are suitable and understand these duties. And in rare situations, responsible persons may actually be suspended or removed from their roles by the ACNC. Um, I would have a look through the fact sheet we have on responsible persons to get some more information about this and you can find that at acnc.gov.au forward slash responsible persons. So how do you actually know who your organisation's responsible persons are? This can be a bit clearer for some charities than others. Some common examples are in the table on your screen now. You can see for incorporated associations, the responsible persons are the members of the committee of management, while for a company limited by guarantee or an indigenous corporation or a cooperative, cooperative, it's generally the directors. For a trust, it's the trustees or the directors of the corporate trustee. For an unincorporated association, it's not always clear. Um, for example, um, a religious organisation, um, there may be a central governing body and branches. Um, there's also organisations incorporated in other ways, such as by an Act of Parliament. 
and the responsible persons for these ones depends on the legislation or charter, um, but it may be a trustee or director or council member. Excuse me. <clears throat> One final thing um, that you do need to consider before starting your charity application with the ACNC um, is the tax concessions that may be available. The ACNC, this is important to make clear that the ACNC does not endorse charity tax concessions. This is done by the ATO. The ACNC makes a judgment on the charity status of the organisation and then passes that on to the ATO. Your charity must be registered with the ACNC before it can receive charity tax concessions from the ATO. The main types of these charity tax concessions are an income tax exemption, refunds on franking credits and dividend, on dividends, goods and services tax, GST concessions, and um, fringe benefits tax rebates. And as we mentioned earlier, some charities, again, depending on what they do and the sort of um, uh, organisation they're registered as, may be eligible to apply for endorsement as a DGR. But uh, I'd like to stress that this is limited to a few categories of charities that meet certain specific criteria. It's not a, an endorsement that comes um, automatically with charity registration. Although the ACNC doesn't decide on charity tax concessions, you, you don't need to apply separately to the ATO. You can apply for your charity tax concessions using the same registration form that you use to register with the ACNC. Um, after we've decided on your organisation's charity status, we'll just pass on the application for, to the ATO so they can have a look at the um, eligibility for the tax concessions. The ATO our decision on the charity status and then decide which types of tax concessions that um, your organisation may be entitled to. And again, this does depend on the type of charity that you, you register as. There may also be some concessions available on certain state taxes, however this does depend on the state and the type of organisation your charity is again, but um, if you wanted to look into that I'd recommend um, contacting the Revenue Office in your state. We do have a list of all the other regular re relevant regulators on our website that um, charities may have to interact with and that can be found at Oh, actually, we don't have it on the screen there. It will be in the follow-up email, but if you wanted to jot it down, if you do have a pen, um, I'll read out the URL, which is acnc.gov.au forward slash regulator list. Um, an important thing to note, to note with the ATO's tax concessions is that they, in some circumstances, they may um, ask you for further information to make sure that you're eligible for the tax concession that you've applied for. Um, the ATO does have some guidance on tax concessions in their not-for-profit section, so we'll send you a link in the follow-up email to um, more information about the ATO's tax concessions. So we've just looked at um, the eligibility requirements to register as a charity and also what's needed to apply, such as having an ABN legal structure sorted, and we've also looked at the benefits and obligations. So how do you actually apply to register your organisation as a charity? Well, you just use our online application form. Go to acnc.gov.au forward slash register. There's no fees involved. Applying is free and also being registered is free. As you work through the application form, you can, you can refer to the registration gu guide, which is available online. The form itself is not too difficult to use if you have all the information you need ready. So it is a good idea to read through the guide first just to get an idea of what information you'll need. We'll also work with you to see if your organisation can, where possible, be registered. So please feel free to ask questions and seek clarification if you have any concerns during your application. You can always call or email our advice services team for any help. Okay, and once you've submitted your application, there are a few things that will happen. First thing is that um, your application will be allocated to a registration analyst to consider um, the application in detail. They will contact you and introduce themselves and, and they'll also ask you for further information if it's required. You can ask them for um, 
you can ask them any questions if you've if you've got any during the process. If you've it's important to note also that if you've forgotten to include something, or if you've if say your constitution is missing uh, a few important clauses or, or that sort of thing, it's not an automatic um, failure on the application process. It's a consultative process whereby the registration analyst will um, uh, take you through what needs to be done and and help you to get to the point where you can uh, where you meet the requirements to be registered. So they will give you the the opportunity to correct any errors or omissions before you finalise the, um, the application and they make their decision. We generally process applications within 28 days of receiving all the required information. So that that's a really important point because if, if a registration analyst receives a case um, that where the information is incomplete or it's missing a few important things, of course the application process may take a little bit longer while um, the, while you get um, the necessary details sorted out. And we will write to you to tell you if your application has been successful and we'll send you a charity pack. Um, in this pack you just receive a registration letter which is signed by the Commissioner, you receive a certificate um, and a password to log into the ACNC charity portal which is the spot that you um, online that you manage all your charity details. And also you receive some information about being registered as a charity and all the obligations that you have. And also importantly, if your application is not successful, we will write to you to tell you why in detail. And you can ask for our decision to be reviewed too if you disagree with it. So of course we do get some applications from organisations that we can't register. Some of the common issues that we see are a lack of suitable set of rules. This means we can't actually identify the organization's objects or whether it's a not-for-profit. The organizations just need a bit more time and assistance to get their documents in order. We often find that such organizations reapply at a later date, and that's fine. There's no black mark um, against you if you aren't successful the first time around. Or we see that the organization does not have a charitable purpose or has both charitable and non-charitable purposes. We spoke about what being charitable means for ACNC purposes. So we do sometimes get sporting clubs or social clubs applying and like we mentioned, unfortunately, while these clubs may have a very worthwhile purpose, they're not actually charitable. We also see some private benefits to members. Um, so some organisations may have a charitable purpose but they might also provide a private benefit to their members. For example, an organisation that's set up to promote the arts, which is charitable, but does this by promoting works for sale of particular artists, who are members of the organisation would not be eligible to be a charity. So the slide that you see sets out some of the common issues um, the ATO sees as well, um, and that includes missing or conflicting information, missing clauses or a mismatch between DGR item numbers and charity purposes. Okay, um, well that's an overview of the key things to keep in mind and um, especially whether you're starting, uh, when you're starting a new organisation and even, even if you're registering your existing not-for-profit as a We hope that this has been useful for everyone who, who joined us today and if you had any questions that they were answered and if you have any further questions um, hang around we'll, we'll, we'll be online for another t uh, 10 or 15 minutes after this webinar to answer any questions that come through but of course feel free to um, uh, send through an email if you think that would be uh, a better way. For more information um, here's a list of the main um, topics that we covered today uh, on our, for the information on our website and also the ATO has lots of information regarding the tax concessions for not-for-profits at ato.gov.au forward slash non-profit and that's a hyphen in between non and profit. And also we recommend um, the information at, uh, provided by um, not-for-profit law at Justice Connect which is um, covers a lot of these basics and, and the, the legal um, ramifications for decisions and you can find all of that at their website at nfplaw.org.au. It's a good one to um, 
to bookmark and, and have a look through. And of course, you can always stay in touch with the ACNC in a number of ways, particularly by subscribing to our updates via the homepage. You can always find more information about the ACNC's program of webinars at acnc.gov.au forward slash webinars, where you can watch past webinars and look at the transcripts. You can always call us on 13 ACNC, which is 132262, and our lines are open between 9 a.m. and 6 p.m. Um, AEST time. Um, you can always email us as well um, at advice at acnc.gov.au and that's always good if you have a complex issue or if you need a more detailed answer. And of course we're always active on our social media accounts so you can find us on Facebook, Twitter and YouTube. Um, you can also get more information from the ATO on citing a not-for-profit and on the tax concessions and benefits and the details are on the screen now. Okay, we'll finish the formal part of the presentation there, but as I mentioned, we'll hang around for a few minutes to answer some questions that keep coming through. So if you've got something that you wasn't answered during the presentation, feel free to um, throw us a question now. We'll get to it as best as we can. Um, remember that, that we do run web webinars for charities at least monthly on a broad range of topics. Um, check the website for upcoming topics. You can find the acnc.gov.au forward slash webinars and that's the spot we can sign up for any new um, webinars that come up. Um, if you're interested to keep being kept up to date just let us know in the survey at the end of the webinar too. We appreciate your feedback as well so that um, we can make these uh, as useful as possible for people um, in the sector or, or looking to, to register charities and as a way to improve our future webinars. If you've got any feedback specifically for the webinars, um, send it through to that email address you can see on the screen, education at acnc.gov.au. But if you're looking for information about tax concessions or what you should do with your charity registration or your structure or that sort of thing, don't send it to education. You're unlikely to get a response in that case. You, you should send those sorts of questions to our advice team. They're the ones best um, place to give you that sort of advice and that email address is, as April mentioned in the previous screen, advice at acnc.gov.au. Thanks April for speaking with me today and also to our silent colleagues Zane and Carolyn who have been answering questions frantically for everyone out there and thanks to everyone for attending. We really appreciate the um, attendance and the support and we will see you next webinar. Thanks.